que no regresarás a darme la felicidad que nos unió. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. It's a pleasure to present today's program, Fantastic Alebrijes by the Linares family, as part of the Fowler's Lunch and Learn series, which offers easily digestible explorations of charismatic objects from around the world found in our permanent collection. I'm so pleased that you've joined us to chew on some sustenance and feed your mind during your lunch break. Today we are joined by Patrick A. Polk, Fowler's Senior Curator of Latin American and Caribbean Popular Arts, as he discusses a chimerical paper mache alebrije crafted by Miguel Linares of Mexico City. We will learn the sources of inspiration for this artistic tradition, considered by many to occupy one of the highest perches in Mexican popular art. Patrick A. Polk is Senior Curator of Latin American and Caribbean Popular Arts and a lecturer for the UCLA Center for the Study of Religion. His research interests include material religion and visual piety, religion and healing, popular religion in North and Latin America, and African diasporic sacred arts. He has curated such Fowler exhibitions as Botanica Los Angeles, Latino popular religion, religious art in the City of Angels, Sinful Saints and Saintly Sinners at the Margins of the Americas, and Ashe Bahia, the Power of Art in Afro-Brazilian Metropolis. Before we get going to technical bits of housekeeping, first, once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click view options and then select side-by-side -side mode so that the video feed doesn't cover any of the presentation. And if you have any questions during this program, please do submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upload questions that you would like to be considered to be answered at the end of the program. All right, that's all from me. Over to you, Patrick. Uh, thank you, Bianca, and, and welcome to everybody that's here today. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you all about some artworks that are near and dear to my heart. And so uh, what I'm going to do today is want to want to focus on certainly the Linares family and their tradition of creating cartoneria or paper mache uh, objects that are utilized for as part of festival activities, festivities, fiestas in traditionally in Mexico. Uh, and then talk a little bit about how they sort of transformed from more regional festive arts to globally renowned uh, objects of folk art and folk creations. And so just, I want to get into a little bit of, about the art form itself, uh, the idea of alebrijes, and you, you can see a little bit of the description on, on this slide here. And then to talk about tradition and innovation, because it's, it's really important to understand uh, the Linares as an extended family of arts makers, uh, again, of international renown, renown within this the, the sort of the dichotomy or the dynamic of tradition in other words artistic practices that are understood to to go back in time and and have crucial meanings for community identity and the and the celebratory life of a of a collective uh, but then also want to look at the role of the individual of particular artists who are visionaries who expand the tradition into new forms and new contexts. And, and again, that really is central to, to understanding Pedro Linares, the, the patriarch of the family, and then his, his children and grandchildren as they, they continue the artistic practice that is represented here. Now, of course, I say all that, and the, the reality, of course, is looking at this slide here, uh, that that is an artwork that literally and figuratively reaches out and grabs you. Uh, the we want to, I want to talk a little bit about what it is that's so compelling about the the idea of the alebrije, and then how those that concept of a chimerical, fantastic creature is, is brought to life through paper mache by members of the Linares family, and what is and again, what is it that's so captivating about it? So. A lot of ground I want to I want to try to cover in our time today. Uh, of course, 
leaving time for answering any questions that any of you might have. I think it is really important for, for us to have as much dialogue as possible so that this isn't just me talking at you, but hopefully me posing some, some questions and bringing up some, some perspectives that then elicit questions from you all. So as I encourage you as Bianca, as Bianca did to, to submit, submit queries, questions that you might have. And, and I certainly will do my best to, to answer them, uh, of course, with the caveat that I don't pretend to be the to be the man who can <laughs> answer every question. If I get one out of three good, uh, I'm I'm happy. All right, so uh, slide. All right, so Pedro Linares Lopez. Uh, generally known as, as Pedro Linares, is, was the patriarch of the Linares family of Mexico City who worked, in, he worked out of a shop near the Mercado Sonora, the Sonora market, right very near the historic center of Mexico City. And he, he developed, he, he get, garnered acclaim for creating paper mache uh, animals, paper mache creatures that were central to sort of the festive life. Let me, let me be more specific. Uh, Pedro became well known for creating a num creating paper mache objects in a number of categories that were important in fiestas and celebrations, whether it be Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, or celebrations for particular saints' days, or for the Semana Santa, the Holy Week, Easter tide festivals. And some of the, the really traditional creatures, uh, objects that were made out of cortoponeria, paper mache, uh, some of them that, that Pedro is well known for crafting and then which he taught to his, his children and, and to, the, to his grandchildren as it passed on, or a couple, of, a couple of really important genres. And what I like about this slide that I'm, that I'm showing here is that this one kind of merges a couple of the genres in which people would be familiar with. And, and I think this, this sort of highlights the, the innovation of, of Pedro is in the sense that one, you see this skeletal figure a, a calaca in colloquial Spanish to talk about the skeleton. Uh, so, which very much is sort of reflects the tradition of skeletons for Day of the Dead celebrations in which you, people in the Linares family became again renowned for crafting skeletal figures that were part of the celebrations and, and, and more about that in a bit. Uh, but also there's this, there is sort of like a, skeleton devil here. And the creation of, of demons, of devils for, again, part of festive, festive festivities like, like the Semana Santa, the Holy Week, um, were, were, was also is very commonplace. Now, what happens in the expectation with many of these paper mache creations is that they would be burned as part of the celebration. And so also Pedro and the family uh, you know, continued the tradition of making paper mache judases that would be burned uh, during festivities as a way of, of talking about a grander Catholic uh, mythology, if I could use that term, of sanctity and, and salvation and literally in the narrative of, of Jesus and Jesus's betrayal in particular by Judas and then the subsequent resurrection. Again, this is sort of an Easter story. And so what will happen during festivities, uh, folks would commission and then acquire uh, paper mache objects that could be paraded, could become focus of ritual activity, and then either burnt or discarded as part of the, uh, part of the sort of the grand scale of events. And, and so this is where, this is sort of how, how we sort of center uh, the Norris family as premier paper mache artisans in, in sort of the historic, the historic heart of Mexico City. Uh, and then there, the innovation of Pedro and other members, there's a real flourishing that their art forms uh, expand beyond those confines. Slide. 
Now, when we talk about tradition and innovation, it is really important to understand and to think about, well, where is it that artists are looking for inspiration? When you're, when you're working with in a traditional practice, you certainly have, well, what, have, what, what did I learn to make? Who taught me to make uh, artworks in a particular kind of way? Uh, what are the expectations of the community of those who would acquire and purchase art or to at least to appreciate the art? And, and those, those inspirations, those sources come from a lot of different directions. And what we see in, in the case of, in the, case of the, the Nares family and, and Pedro in particular, uh, was a real effort to look at uh, popular artwork in, in Mexico from the late 19th into the 20th century. And Jose Guadalupe Posada uh, is, is incredibly influential in, in certainly in terms of 19th and 20th century Mexican popular arts in general. Uh, but, but Pedro and, and other members of the Linares family looked very, very closely at the kinds of tradition, kinds of prints produced by Posada for newspapers, for chapbooks, for other kinds of ephemera, uh, popular arts, and, and drew a lot of inspiration, whether it be sort of playing off of devil or demon-like images created by Posada, or, or certainly the calaveras, the skulls and, and skeleton figures that Posada was famous for, for creating, again, for, for popular print literature. And so drawing a lot of influence uh, directly from one artist, from one artistic genre to another. And, and, and again, you, you, you can see this in some very directly, and, and I'll, I'll get to this in a minute, because you, know, you, know, you were promised Alebrijes, and here's really, you know, when we're getting to the creation of this this form, really in the mid 20th century, but it's rooted in a number of, of earlier artistic practices or influences. So the paper mache piece that you're you're looking at on on the slide here, is was described by Pedro as one of his first ones, his primer titos, his first first, his one of his, his initial or his original alabrijes, and so he himself, as he talked about this and and as his family talked about uh, the alabrijes that are so closely associated with their with their practice is the is is Pedro says that this was something he developed out of his own experiences and it emerged and in fact the alabrijes were one main avenue by which he he began to move out of the sort of the constraints of traditional paper mache expectations. In other words, people were looking for the devil uh, to burn or St. Jude, San Judas to burn during festivities or other kind of more traditional, more traditional uh, forms. And he, he found in the Alabrijes a much more personal expression. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but but also an op, you know an opportunity to to move move in a new direction, and and then the ultimate outcome of that, of course, was to to establish a, a category of artistic practice that didn't necessarily exist uh, prior to his prior to his his innovations. Now, of course. The whole concept of alabrije is shrouded in sort of the mist of history and mystification. Uh, Pedro claimed to have invented the term alabrije and his, his members of his family also suggest that this was something that they, a terminology that they, that they first utilized in describing these fantastic creatures. Uh, and other folks have suggested that the term actually has its roots in in you know indigenous language and a number of other folks have suggested alternate uh, origins for for the term itself but it, it there really is there's this is solid ground uh to to talk about a particularly uh identifiable provable history uh so but certainly certainly pedro was using this term very early on, and it was one in which they used in the term in which they used to to describe to describe the these this genre that they were that were crafting. 
And, and it's not an unusual thing. I think people people create terminologies all the time. I mean, one way to maybe translate it is sort of like, you know, if you think my little my little monster links or my little my little my little, you know, it's sort of an invented term that is seems to be the case. The main question, of course, is right, who invented it? And and that's a little phase fuzzy, but certainly Pedro, Pedro made that claim. Slide. So when we when we think about Alabrijes, and we've already seen a couple of these, a couple of the images, uh, and I think it's really important that even as Pedro talked about his his active innovation, and in fact Pedro discussed with a, a Mexican researcher uh, the the moment as he experienced it in which Alabrijes came to life for him. And, and the way that Pedro described it was that in sometime in the 1950s, he was seriously ill and he was running a very high fever and in fact was delirious. And as he re recollected it, he, he felt in fact, not that he was near death, but in fact, he, he had what we might call a near death experience. And when he was in that, that sort of state of going away, of, of going to the other side of, of, of losing this life for that next life, whatever it is. At that moment, when he was in between there, he had these visions of these monstrous figures that, uh, that, that came to him with fangs and wings and claws. And you know, he, he recognized them as, as horrific beings. And then, but then he, he survived, he, he came to, he came out of the delirium, he, he recovered and he remembered those, he remembered those, those creatures that were, you know, very visions. Uh, and so he began, ultimately he began to realize those in, in his craft. But, but so he understood this Alabrijes to be something very, very personal and something related to sort of the larger context of, of human experience. It, it almost, we can talk about it as sort of like the cosmic level. Now, right, that, that's his experience and how he relates that, that moment of innovation. But at, at the same time, we have to say, well, I mean, we can look at an image like the one in the slide here from, from Posada and say, okay, well, there's also, there also are visual influences. There are other things going on with the idea, particularly in relation to say the human soul and to the human human experience both in this life and in transition to to another life and and and, uh, and under, you have, we need to understand here of course that we're talking about uh mexico in which catholic catholic understandings of life and death and afterlife are, are central to to popular culture and so we can see where posada creates a print here with the seven deadly sins of pride and avarice and you know greed and envy and these sort of, these sorts of things here uh, that these what Posada is doing in the late 19th century and, and doing in into the 20th century is materializing certain aspects of the human experience which which clearly clearly uh, Pedro Linares, Linares is doing this as well when he starts to create create alabrijes, that he makes a direct connection to this to this experience he had, uh, that was both physical, right? It was it was experience of body, uh, but it was also a metaphysical experience, an experience of of with the supernatural. And, and so so again, my my point here again of us looking at Posada, is recognizing that you have that the alabrijes come out of a context of of tradition. That within Mexican popular culture, there is a tradition of representing aspects of the human condition as monstrous. In this case, in the case of, of the Posada image here, as of the sins as these these attacking, fantastic, uh, you know, creatures to which one is is subjected. And, and of course, I want to talk a little bit more about Posada. The Posada's art and his, his prints in particular were very much a, attuned to social conditions. Uh, Posada was a satirist. Posada took shots at the powerful 
to his prints. And so, so that he, he utilized his art as a way to talk about co class conditions, uh, particularly uh, pointing out the, the problems associated with political power, with elitism, with economic disparities in, in, in Mexico during his lifetime. And, and so the, the creatures that Posada populated his popular art with were creatures meant to speak to viewers and to, to key the viewers into, into crucial issues in, in everyday life, right? So now, right, having said that, we can sort of look at what the origin story with, with Pedro Linares about his alabrijes, the, again, these were entities, these were monsters that, that came to him, came to him in a, in a moment of crisis and that appeared and as, as assailing entities perhaps, but at very least of fantastic things. And in his moment of crisis that they, they left they left a, a mark on him, one in which certainly interviews that he he gave with with researchers from uh, for over the course of of several several decades highlighted his sort of a continuing effort to to realize what he saw when he was under when he was when he was seriously ill, and, and, and certainly, you know, the exhibition that was at publication was headed by Susan Mazaroka at the Fowler Museum with the title "And Calavera," did a wonderful job of of unpacking the artistic practice of of Pedro and and his family as an ongoing process of revealing. Slide. And so what I want to sort of talk about here a bit is going really to get into a little bit more with our time. I know time is running fast. I said I want to show a couple of now of more recent ones to see that what happened was you have with the Linares family, and again, why they gather so much acclaim and so important, is the, is the ability to take a tradition and to take several traditions, in fact, to take the tradition of paper mache objects uh, that are created for festivals functioning holiday holiday uh, celebratory decorations in, in many ways to take that tradition and then to really merge that merge that with another artistic tradition the the prints of posada and to bring those together uh, and then to add in uh, one more part of of personal vision and so the alabrijes spring out of the workshop of, of Pedro, uh, but you know they're springing out of the mind and or even the soul, if you will, of, of, of Pedro from, from that experience. And then it becomes refined and refined. And so what was also happening in Mexico, and this is, this is really important in the middle of the 20th century, uh, was an effort on the part of the government, of the central government in, in the district, federal district of, of Mexico. And, and then also local governments was to the, the creation was the was the creation of folk art traditions in different states in different parts of Mexico and the federal the government support of of folk art as a way of supporting local economies of sort of helping to increase tourism and so Pedro Pedro is working out of his studio there in, in, in Mexico City at a, a really important time in Mexico. And when folk art or popular arts are not only being put on the map as an essence of Mexican cultural identity, of Mexican heritage, but also at the moment when there's a real in, international fervor, uh, and it very much supported by the Mexican government to popularize uh, arts, traditional arts, folk arts of Mexico and those artists. And so, so a certain kind of magic happens in the same way that in, in Pedro's vision of these alabrijes coming after him, what you end up getting is then a living reality of alabrijes flowing out from him and, and, and literally flying around the world. Next slide. With their with their wings and their and their fangs, uh, and, and just 
capturing a full guard audience from their their beauty from the in particularly as his as his sons take over the practice and establish their own studios and in fact the Linares family really is in many ways think about it as a series of of sons and now grandsons in particular working with their families and their 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 studio assistants out of a number of studios and not all in Mexico City anymore uh, but they you get this formalized now understanding of the Alabrije as emblematic of Mexican folk art. And so, in fact, what I'm trying to say is you sort of have a, you have traditions that then have meet with innovation from particular artists, Pedro Linares being a, a classic example of that. And then that innovation becomes tradition. And next slide. And right, and so you you have uh, works that look nothing like what would have one would have found in paper mache uh, fifty years ago in Mexico City. This is something new, uh, but it's also something old. So if you know, this is the last the last piece I want to you know second last piece I want to talk about talk about real quick here. Of this is a very new form, uh, but also what's very old about this is that in fact here you have sort of this winged dragon-like beast holding a snake, but one also can read this as a fantastic variation on the national emblem of Mexico, which is the eagle holding the serpent, which of course in itself harkens back to a mythological narrative from the, from the Mexico or Aztec empire of the founding of, of Tenochtitlan, which is the central center of the empire, which is a site in which an eagle was seen holding a serpent. So there, there are traditions that continue through this form and continually going back to, to even cent ancient motifs, uh, but in, with also in a very new, very original, form and slide uh, and again just one last one last dragon bird bird dragon uh, a works that are just amazing amazing to see and 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 what I would also add here to see when we get to Felipe and the sons and then moving into the next generation. Uh, there certainly was fear. Some have expressed fear that this was a tradition that would not outlast Pedro. There was a concern to whether he learned the tradition from his father. Uh, but what is often a real problem with traditional folk arts is that will the next generation, will the next generation uh, need to practice the art for survival? in other words, as, a, as an occupation, uh, but also do subsequent generations move on to other interests? And, and in the case of Linares is that it is, it, it, tradition continues and, and which, is, which is heartening to say, to say the least. Okay, that I'm, I'm done. I think we were right. Ooh, well, we got a little bit of time. So if, uh, we have questions. How how are we handling the questions? Should I look at the question and answer and answer them? Oh, well, excuse me. I was going to uh, feed you some questions here, and okay. then you don't have to worry about going through the portal. Okay. Yeah, we've got some really good questions rolling in. Well, first and foremost, actually, I'd love to answer Harriet and John's question okay. about the size of these objects. Uh, yeah. I well, I apologize for not putting the size on there. Uh, the, the, the pieces that are in those particular images, uh, those are, most of those are around, you know, 20, anywhere from 20 to 30 or four inch, 20 to 30 or so inches in height. Uh, some of the Linares pieces, uh, particularly the Day of the Dead pieces could get to be life size. So you could have six, seven foot pieces. Uh, but most of the Alabrijes are much, much smaller at a more, uh, carryable uh, size, more packable, and, and that particularly the Alabrije is produced, generally produced by Lenar's different members of the Lenar's family, uh, tend to function more, more, uh, you know, sort of a, be able to purchase it and, and, and carry it home. Uh, but some, some do get much larger. Some do get much larger. Uh, okay. And are they typically signed and dated or not so much? 
Uh, some yes, some no. I mean, it, it's sort of the, the truth of folk art often is sometimes the expectation that you don't sign it. Uh, sometimes folks do sign. It, it really depends on, on the particular context of production. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, people pointing out some similarities um, with other forms of art and how it may have been influenced um, or how it may have influenced Linares. So they're wondering um, if you think that perhaps Linares was influenced by Chinese art. Um, Joan says that so much reminds her of Chinese dragons. And we've also got someone, Peggy, asking about um, Hopi Kachina, um, the paper mache artistry called Hopi Kachina, and that can be either wood or paper mache, any chance that that Native American tradition would have been known by the Linares family? Well, I mean, this is the reality, of course, is that that artists, frequently being artists, look for inspiration where they find it. Uh, I, I do know, I do know, and, and this is, again, is thanks to a number of, of researchers, is that uh, in studio, the Linares is definitely would sort of collect images and collect things and sort of and use a wide variety of sources for inspiration so it, it certainly it could well be that some of for some of the dragon-like creatures that folks were looking at art catalogs at a variety of other kinds of materials for influence i mean i think ultimately the thing that i wish i could do uh but these these were all pe these were pieces collected prior to my time uh is is you know to have the ability to, to sit with the artist and say okay What's going on here? <laughs> what, what's going on in this image? Uh, I, my, my, I would assume uh, that that the influence is, in terms of the artistic influences, the range of influences is much greater than a lot of people sometimes would have it be. Uh, all right. Yeah, I think that answers that. That nice. Yeah. And and, and someone, um, Marina. Uh, Jimenez is wondering if you know if there are actually any Judas sculptures in existence um, in Chinese stands because they were being created with the specific intent of burning an effigy. If you know yeah. about it, yeah, we have we have several in our collection that are labeled as Judases, and and often right. And the reality of the way that Judas works in in that particular popular cultural tradition, right? So you're like, is that a is that a Judas or is that a devil, right? But you know, but but there's certainly some that we have labeled as as a Judas and and crafted by by Pedro. And, and so they, they exist in collections. Certainly the National Museum of Popular Arts in Mexico City uh, ha has in their collection. Uh, and so I think what ended up happening in particular when as folk art became more important to sort of the political agenda in Mexico, uh, you know, and, and then you had, you had institutions purposely collecting traditions, collecting objects. And so sure, there, May, generally made to be burned, but then also some are, are certainly acquired for for preservation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so yeah, they're they are they are out there. They they are they are out there in collections and in public and private collections. There's there's some people certainly in Southern California that have unbelievable collections of Linares pieces, and and, and Pedro Pedro was creating paper mache objects from the 19. 50s. Uh, I think it's, I'm, I'm also looking, I think, at Jill Vexler's comment at, about that is that the Linares, Linares family were creating these going back to that time period. Uh, the thing that isn't, un, that isn't really clear is at what point the first alabrijes really were being made and that they were calling them alabrijes because Pedro talks about having had that vision in the 50s and, but then he specifically talked about some objects in our collection as being his some of his early ones, but but those are like dated from like the 70s. So so it's 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 a little unclear when when the term alabrije as a and as a concept and a form crystallized, uh, but also that that's not unusual at all. I mean, and the one reason I kind of highlighted earlier on about about the fuzziness about the term alabrije is that there are always contesting narratives. Uh, you know, I saw a question somebody had earlier here about talking about Celaya and Guanajuato. Uh, and in, as far as I've seen in a number of the regions where I've looked at the folk arts, uh, there are very different narratives that people talk about in terms of who was the first, 
who was the first one to be the first master of what came to be known as a particular regional one, regional tradition, uh, with, you know, and, and right, like anything, art, you know, expect contesting narratives. Uh, I think one of the important kinds of things is, is there's a lot of flow back and forth. And so what you'll see in some parts of Mexico, folks will do wooden versions. They'll do things that look very much like a, very much like a Linares paper mache alebrije, but then make it out of wood. And, 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 and again, these really kind of uh, go back to a particular kind of zeitgeist in Mexico, one, where there was a lot of effort to create folk art folk art cooperatives and support folk artists in different states of Mexico. And then the other thing is people, artists, watch what sells, <laughs> you know? And you're like, oh, okay, those are, there's a market for that. So how do I innovate? How do I take that tradition and, and do a different kind of spin on it? Awesome. Well, you know, we're almost out of time, but I did want to mention that um, someone asked in the Q&A portal if the Linares studio is still around creating Alebrijes, and Elsa Linares says, yes, my father Miguel Linares, my brother Ricardo Linares, and myself, Elsa Linares, we are still creating Alebrijes, and you can actually visit their Facebook page um, at uh, Alebrijes Linares and find out more. Beautiful. Beautiful, I indeed. Uh, I think that uh, people should take every opportunity they have to to acquire acquire these traditions because it is a vibrant tradition. I've seen a couple questions. Uh, you know, a number of members of the Linares family produce, uh, and right when we have an opportunity, if you have an opportunity to go to to, to Mexico City, uh, certainly put it on your put it on your itinerary to visit uh, Linares Studios. Yes, I hope one day to be able to do so myself. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was awesome. And we had such a great crowd today. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, this is uh, going to be recorded. It will be available on our Instagram and on the Fowler website for you to revisit and share as you see fit. And thank you all for joining us today. You can find more information about our next program on our closing slide. Thanks again, Patrick. Welcome. All right, guys, have a good day. See you next time. Bye.